So there are many other regional blocks and virtually uh, every portion of a limb can be blocked using a, a, a regional technique. So it's possible to do multiple blocks on the upper limb and multiple blocks in the lower limb. The way we used to do this, the way I was taught to do it, was to feel for an artery, uh, the assumption being that the nerves to a certain area were closely in contact with that artery, pass the, the needle towards the artery until the patient complained of an electric shock going down their arm or down their leg. Obviously not a pleasant experience at which point we would inject. The problem was that it failed a lot of the time. And if you actually got too close to the nerve and pierced the nerve, causing that paresthesia, that electric shock feeling, you could actually damage the nerve. And because we weren't seeing where the needle tip was going, even though we were trying not to hit the artery that we were palpating at the same time, it wasn't unusual to hit the artery and for hematoma to form in the area. So it really wasn't a very satisfactory uh, technique. And many of us essentially stopped using regional blocks for upper limbs and lower limbs because of that problem. About 10 years ago, uh, the use of the nerve stimulator to identify the nerve position was introduced. And this has actually made the whole technique more successful, uh, but still not as perfect as I'm going to show in a moment. With a nerve stimulator, you start with a low current, usually around 10 amps, milliamps, and you advance it towards the nerve, and you watch the, uh, the patient's muscles to see if there's a twitch that goes along with the nerve you're trying to block. So what you'll see is this kind of thing. And as you get closer to the nerve, you turn down the current, but you try to maintain the twitch, and you try to get as close to the nerve as you can at the lowest possible current around one milliamp is ideal, at which point you inject the local anesthetic. Again, the whole procedure is blind other than the fact that you're putting a, a current in and you can see some movements in the limb. You can't actually see the position of the nerve. You can't see the position of any arteries that might be in the area. In the last five to 10 years, a technique uh, developed by Vincent Chan in Toronto uh, has been widely accepted by anesthesiologists, and this has really changed uh, our uh, mode of delivering uh, regional anesthesia and has improved the outcomes dramatically. This is called ultrasound guided needle placement. And basically what it is, is using ultrasound to identify vessels and nerves, and then passing a needle through tissue watching the needle with the ultrasound until you're very close to the nerve and then injecting the local anesthetic uh, at the nerve. And you can see all this using the ultrasound. But as you'll see in the video we're going to show you, it's not as easy to see as you might think. And it does require a significant amount of training and practice to become good at it. The good effect of this, though, has been that the success rate of regional analgesia and anesthesia has improved dramatically. And this has really improved care, particularly for patients having shoulder surgery, upper limb surgery, and lower limb sur surgery. Uh, a lot of the technique has led to excellent postoperative pain control, which we didn't previously have. Now we'll watch a video on ultrasound guided femoral nerve block. So this is an ultrasound guided femoral nerve block. And the large black object in the right upper corner, it's just disappearing now, is the femoral artery. And the way you know this is an artery is that when the anesthetist compresses the tissue, the artery is not completely compressed. And this is a large artery, so you can actually see it pulsating. The anesthetist is now going to pass the needle from the skin uh, in a lateral fashion down towards the artery. It's easy to see the shaft of the needle, but it's much more important to see the tip of the needle. And sometimes it's difficult to see the tip. That, re that ultrasound opaque uh, object that the needle tip is up against now is the femoral nerve. You do not want to enter that nerve. If you enter it, the patient will complain of severe pain, or you'll notice when you try to inject local anesthetic that you can't. So back off from that if it occurs. But with ultrasound, once you learn how to identify the tip, you can go very, very close to the nerve. So you can see this tip is right up against the nerve. And in just a moment, we're gonna actually be able to see 
the local anesthetic being injected there. You can see that uh, little shadow that developed and the local anesthetic surrounds the nerve or at least uh, it forms a pocket at the base of the nerve and within a few seconds the patient starts to lose sensation along the distribution of that nerve and the uh, needle can be removed. Now this uh, portion here, the anesthetist is going anterior to the nerve, whereas the pr previous injection was posterior, they want to put local anesthetic around the nerve, so they're going to inject anterior to the nerve as well. So regional anesthesia has improved dramatically with this technique that was introduced by Vincent Chan in Toronto. Brachial plexus for the upper limb, uh, you can see in this diagram how complicated the brachial plexus is as it comes from the neck, out through the shoulder area, and down into the arm. And we're going to describe very briefly blocks in the upper limb that can be done, an interscaling approach, which is actually in the neck, a supraclavicular approach, which is from above the clavicle, an intra, uh, infraclavicular approach, which is just below the clavicle, and an axillary approach, which is through the, uh, through the armpit. And these are the areas that can be blocked. And each of these nerves uh, can be blocked using one of these techniques, but each of these techniques has certain areas that it blocks better than others. So the infraclavicular block, uh, which is shown in this picture here, uh, you can see the clavicle has been drawn and that the anesthesiologist is placing the needle below the clavicle. That's an infraclavicular block. It's good, a good block for elbow, arm, and hand surgery. A supraclavicular block, so you go above the clavicle, a little bit more towards the midline, you get excellent blocks of the elbow, arm, uh, forearm, and, and the hand. The interscaling block, which is in the neck, up at the level of the cricoid cartilage at C6, is a little bit riskier, and we'll describe why in a couple of moments, but it's a really good block for shoulder and elbow surgery. And shoulder surgery is extremely painful postoperatively, so this is a great block uh, either for surgery, but more commonly for analgesia after surgery. The axillary approach through the armpit is, uh, is what we used to do, and it's not as reliable as the other blocks. It's not a bad block if you're lucky with it and get it for the forearm and hand, but it's not as, as, as reliable as the other blocks, so it's not widely used anymore. The interscaling block can result in a total spinal block. So this is why it's a little riskier than the other blocks. And a total spinal block basically results in complete loss of sensation from almost the eyebrows to the bottom of the feet. And this is a very serious complication because it blocks the entire sympathetic nervous system as well as all the sensory and motory nerves and the patient can't breathe, the blood pressure plummets, and that's a major issue. But we can deal with it if it happens. The other problem with an interscaling block, although this doesn't usually happen, but it's possible to get a pneumothorax, a punctured lung. It's common to get a phrenic nerve block. The phrenic nerve is the nerve that supplies motor function to the diaphragm, and the nerve comes off of C2-3 and goes down all the way to the diaphragm and provides the motor control of the diaphragm. So with an interscaling block, you always get a hemidiaphragmatic paralysis. So the, the diaphragm on that side is always paralyzed. This is not usually a problem, but if you've got a patient who's uh, got respiratory problems, particularly uh, chronic obstructive lung disease, uh, where they need a lot of muscle uh, activity both to inspire and expire, this can be a problem. You never do it on both sides because you'll completely block both diaphragms in that situation. Horner syndrome, which is a block of the sympathetic nervous system to the face, uh, also is common, and this causes uh, pupil to become very constricted. Uh, you get a congested nose and loss of sensation on the side of the face. It's not a, a, a serious problem. It gets better uh, in a relatively short period of time, but it's typical of what happens with, a, uh, with a, an interscaling block. The commonest complication with a supraclavicular block is uh, pneumothorax, again, puncture of the lung, and this can occur in, in up to 6% of patients. Horner's syndrome occurs commonly with this block, and phrenic nerve blo block and occasional arterial hemorrhage can occur. 
The problem with arterial hemorrhage in this situation and in the inferior clavicular block is that the artery that's bleeding is the subclavian artery and it's very hard to put pressure on that artery because it's under the clavicle. So that can be a problem. The block should be uh, avoided in patients with respiratory disease because of the phrenic block. The infraclavicular block can also cause pneumothorax and arterial hemorrhage. Uh, and both are uh, relatively uncommon, fortunately, but it can occur. They also can cause, it also can cause phrenic nerve paralysis. The axillary approach is more likely to cause nerve damage because there's a great variety of nerves in that area. Uh, and uh, it's also common to get bleeding and infection in the axillary block. So it's not used as much as it once was. Lower limb blocks can either be done at the level of the femoral nerve. In the video we just saw, saw that was a femoral nerve block. And that'll give you an excellent block of the thigh down to the knee. Uh, and uh, good, good for post-operative pain control, not a great block for actual surgery. And then we do, our other blocks tend to be lower in the leg, uh, uh, behind the uh, knee in the popliteal fossa, uh, or down at the ankle. So usually if, you've got, if you're going to use a lower limb block for anesthesia, it's better to just go ahead and do a spinal or an epidural and use that block for the uh, anesthesia for the surgery and then do a femoral nerve block or a sciatic nerve block or a combination of the both for post-operative analgesia. I've shown you how we do a femoral nerve block. Sciatic nerve block is significantly more difficult and uh, requires uh, uh, a lot more skill to do than a femoral nerve block. So here's a demonstration of femoral nerve block using just landmarks and palpation rather than the uh, ultrasound guided technique we showed you a moment ago. And when you palpate the, uh, the inguinal area, it's very easy to feel the femoral artery. And if you consider the femoral canal to consist of artery, nerve, ring, you can think in the position of all these uh, 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 organs uh, if you think of Mr. Van. So in this acronym, the N stands for median, so right medial inside the leg. R sounds for the femoral ring. V is the femoral vein. A is the femoral artery. And N is the femoral nerve. So if you're feeling the artery, the nerve should be just lateral to the artery. This is the position that's often used for the sciatic nerve block. As I mentioned earlier, this is a more difficult block. The landmarks are often difficult to identify, particularly in uh, obese patients. And uh, it's not commonly done unless uh, you're actually a very good regional anesthesiologist. The ankle block is commonly done for foot surgery in which a tourniquet isn't used to prevent bleeding during the surgery. And it's a relatively easy block. They're usually uh, three needle positions in the front of the foot, one a little bit lateral, one a little bit medial, and you can see the three nerves that we try to catch with that. And that'll give quite good uh, anesthesia to the whole foot. Uh, if you need to use a tourniquet, however, and many surgeons require this uh, to prevent bleeding in the foot, the tourniquet has to be placed higher than this. And tourniquets uh, produce a lot of pressure and can become very uncomfortable in a relatively short period of time. And this block doesn't prevent the sensation of the tourniquet. So if you're going to use a tourniquet, you really can't use this block. This is an intravenous regional anesthetic block. And this is a block that's used for very simple procedures in the forearm. So things like removing little ganglia from the wrist, doing median nerve decompressions, this is a block that can be used. It uses a double tourniquet technique. So there's a proximal tourniquet, which is near to the body, a distal tourniquet, which is away from the body. You elevate the patient's arm. After you've started an IV in that, uh, in that arm, you just put a needle in and cover it at that point. Elevate the patient's arm for several minutes, and then you use what's called an Eschmark bandage, which is really just a big, fat elastic. And you wrap it around the arm very tightly, to push all the blood out of the arm, at which point you inflate the proximal cuff, so the cuff nearest to the body. Take the tourniquet off and then fill the limb 
through the, the IV that you've started with half percent lidocaine. It's usually between 30 and 40 milliliters, and you can tell the approximate amount you're using by just looking at the veins in the forearm, and if they're starting to swell, then you've probably put an adequate amount of local anesthetic in. You have to wake probably five minutes before you get a good effect, but that's usually time for the positioning of the arm and the prepping of the surgical position. You have to take the needle out of the hand at this point, and then the surgeon can go ahead and do the surgery. If the patient starts to have discomfort from the tourniquet at some point, you can inflate the distal tourniquet, which is over tissue that has been blocked. And once you know the distal tourniquet is actually inflated, you can deflate the proximal tourniquet and the patient will have an instant relief from the pressure that they had on their arm. This block is a very safe block if you, if you do it properly. At the end of surgery, if it's been less than 30 minutes since you injected the anesthetic, you should wait. Do not deflate the tourniquet yet. Many anesthesiologists believe that it's worthwhile to deflate the tourniquet in, in a, a series of steps to allow only a small amount of local anesthetic to reach the central circulation if there is still local anesthetic present in the limb that hasn't been bound to tissues. So you deflate the tourniquet and reinflate it immediately again. You do that two or three times over a minute or two, and uh, the uh, local anesthetic is washed out of the limb, uh, and the sensation returns usually within four or five minutes. So it's a pretty short duration once the, uh, once the tourniquet is released. Intravenous regional anesthesia is easy to do. Uh, the only problem is that the surgical site tends to be wet, a lot of local anesthetic floating around, and some uh, surgeons find this annoying. So local anesthetic toxicity uh, can occur with intravenous regional anesthesia, particularly if the wrong drug or the wrong concentration is injected. The only drug that is safe in this situation is half percent lidocaine. When bupivacaine or stronger uh, uh, concentrations of lidocaine have been given, the spillage of those drugs into the central circulation can cause serious side effects, including cardiac arrest or seizures. Finally, as I mentioned, many anesthesiologists advise releasing the tourniquet for five to 10 seconds and then reinflating and repeating that oh, two or three times after the uh, uh, surgery is completed. So in summary, in this talk, we've uh, talked about regional anesthesia and analgesia. We've spent some time discussing epidural or, and spinal anesthesia, neuraxial blocks, and how they can be used for surgery, or in the case of epidurals, how it can be used for labor uh, analgesia or for post-operative pain control. We've talked about various methods by which re uh, peripheral nerves can be blocked, with emphasis on uh, ultrasound-guided uh, techniques that have higher uh, efficacy and lower complication rates. And finally, we talked about intravenous regional anesthesia, the pros and cons of that technique, uh, and, uh, uh, and how it can be uh, used uh, for surgery of minor peripheral uh, limb lesions.